Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll see how Maricopa County is streamlining its process for adoptions. Also tonight, does a state smoking ban apply to e-cigarettes? And check out an exhibit that shows how archaeologists uncover the secrets of ancient Egypt. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Maricopa County Juvenile Court System is streamlining the adoption process. The goal is to make adoptions quicker and more efficient. Here to tell us more is Judge Bradley Ostrowski of the Maricopa County Juvenile Court. Thank you so much for being here. This is now a juvenile court adoption unit, correct? That is correct. The unit became live on August 1st of this year. And why was this needed? Why was it created? Quite frankly, volume. Unfortunately, we have so many kids in care. We're close to 16,000 kids in care in the state of Arizona. With the increased volume of kids in care, you're gonna have an increase in adoptions. The increased volume now, is that just because we have more people in the state? Is it proportionately more? What are the numbers telling us? It's a bit disproportionately more. To give you an example of some past statistics, in 2010, there was about 10,500 kids in care. Now we're up to 16,000. So part of it is population driven. Part of it is perhaps we're doing a, a better job from the social service perspective. Part of it also has to do with methamphetamine use as well. I was gonna say, that we know the problems are out there, but are there specific problems? Why are there so many kids being removed from their families and waiting for new ones? Well, I can tell you from what I See, I don't know if there's studies to back this up, just, but just anecdotally from what I see in my quorum, methamphetamine use is significant in terms of that, as well as mental health issues. And as far as adoptive families, uh, not as many in the past? No, the first person that we'd like to adopt the child, obviously if you can't have reunification with the biological parents or grandparents, some family members, sometimes that's not always possible. So we have to go through licensed foster homes or friends of families. And, and is that process and what you look for in undergoing that process, has that changed over the years? That process has not changed over the years. What about other processes involved? Well, what you look at for is a social study of the prospective adoptive home. So a person goes in, they're licensed, and they see if it's a good home, can they financially meet the needs of a child or children that they are adopting. Then you have to do a fingerprint clearance as well to make sure there is no background issue in terms of felony issues or even misdemeanor issues with regards to the people. Not just the people doing the adoption, but all people living in the home. So you can have extended family, friends, mm -hmm. adult children, for example, and that hasn't changed. So if it, let's say you, you, this family's watching right now and they're interested, they're curious, they want to know a little bit more. G give us a little bit of it right there, but give us more of an indication what the process involves, A, and B, what this new adoption unit might streamline or make quicker. Well, first you have to make sure that the child is free to be adopted. So sometimes that's through consent, and unfortunately that's most of the time through the termination of parental rights that is done in front of a trial, in front of a judge. After the child is free for adoption, then what happens is that DCS, formerly CPS, will have the case transferred to the adoption unit, and they help the adoptive family go through that process. That is scheduling the adoptive home study. That is filling out adoption subsidy paper because there is monies that an adoptive home can get to help raise the child. Then there's getting fingerprints and doing the fingerprint clearance as well. Then there's the whole paperwork process. There's identifying an attorney to handle the adoption. Sometimes the attorney general can handle that. The Maricopa County attorney in uncontested adoptions provides that service free of charge to adoptive families. Plus there's private attorneys you can retain as well. So again, it, now in the past, was that just extended, the same kind of uh, situation, but extended? Or what, what, what changes now with the new unit? Sure, it really has to do with volume driven. In the past, it was the same process, however, we didn't have the same volume. So therefore, you had fewer number of people dedicated to helping streamline or helping handle and process the paperwork. Now when you have an increase in volume, you can't have the same number of people handling that increase in volume. So now we have a dedicated unit that is within the court administration. No additional monies were spent to create the unit. In other words, they just rededicated resources to make sure that 
the increased volume is handled appropriately. I was going to ask about funding, and so you don't have to worry about dedicated funds or anything? It's all right there? That's correct. So they just had to rededicate resources. Okay. Now, the pro we, we just kind of went through a process here. How long, in general, does that take? It depends on who the adoptive parent is. So, for example, if it is a relative, like a grandparent or aunt or a sibling, that process takes a bit shorter because they don't have to necessarily go through the adoptive home study. And then that process can take just a few months. However, if it is someone who is not a relative, just a licensed foster home or family friend, they have to go through the home study and that could take a few months process. That could be a few months. Correct. Okay. And again, with this now, this new unit, things are supposed to be quicker, things are supposed to be more efficient. But I can see some folks saying, is this expediency at the cost of, of, of safety, at the cost of caution? It's not expediency for expediency's sake. We're just not trying to move kids out of the system. We still need to do what's in the best interest of the kids, which is what we're all about in the juvenile court system. It's just a matter of putting more resources to handle the volume. To give you an example, Last year alone, close to 1,500 families had to be certified for adoption go through this process. If you have limited resources to do that, it's just going to take longer to vet all that paperwork. Sure. Uh, who's vetting this new unit now? Who's involved? Who are these folks and uh, where are they coming from? Court administration, so they're employees that have already been there, or we dedicated resources from juvenile probation department as well to fund, or probably I shouldn't say fund, to staff this unit. And you're saying the unit is, has been up and operational since August 1st? That is correct. And what are you seeing so far? So far, so good. We're not seeing the adoptions yet. So in a few months from now, we'll okay. see those adoptions. For example, on November 22nd of this year, it's National Adoption Day. I'd like to talk a little bit about, about that, if that's okay. Sure. Because that is one of the best days of the year. It's always the Saturday before Thanksgiving so that people can have their first Thanksgiving together. And here in Maricopa County, we have one of the largest National Adoption Day events in the country, where we adopt out 300 or so children just on that one day. My goodness, and again, but, but this, if that's a National Adoption Day, when you say, I, I'm a little confused, when you say you've adopted out these children, does that mean the process starts or the process has been completed? That means the process is completed, and on National Adoption Day, they go before a judge, and they, the judge reviews all of the paperwork, makes sure it's in order, and then on that day you ask them some questions and if it's in the children's best interests and all the requirements of the law have been met, you grant the adoption. You pronounce them a whole family on that day. So in order to get that day as the completion date, you got to get started relatively soon. Exactly, and that's why we have the adoption unit in place so they can process all of this paperwork so that people can have their adoptions finalized. And a lot of people choose to have their adoptions finalized on National Adoption Day because it's such a special oh, day. Oh, sure, I'm so sure. Now, again, it, only since August 1st, and again, it's hard to get reaction and to get to responses so far, but are you hearing feedback from folks involved in the process from all angles? Are you hearing, and are there ways to tinker with this and make it even more efficient? Well, we'll get feedback from everyone involved, whether it's DCS, Department of Child Safety, whether it's the attorneys involved, or whether it's the families themselves and to tinker it. The one good thing about Maricopa County Superior Court is we are one of the leaders in the country in terms of being proactive. And that's what really what this was about, was being proactive, recognizing there is a need, and having the leadership through Norm Davis, the presiding judge, Janet Barton, the associate presiding judge, and Colin McNally, the presiding juvenile court judge, saw an issue and say, hey, let's be proactive. Let's head this off before it becomes a problem. And, and last question, how do we keep it from becoming a problem. I mean, this is, again, a little bit of a far afield from the concept of an adoption unit being created, but there are so many kids out there. There are so many adoptive, adoptive families looking, and yet it seems like the twain aren't meeting. Can that be improved? I'm not sure if that needs to be improved. I'm not necessarily seeing that issue. And I say that as one of the baby court judges. In other words, the type of judge that I am, the type of calendar that I have, involves children under the age of three. So when you have kids under the age of three, typically the need out there or the demand out there from a foster perspective is, I want a young kid yes. because they have the potential to adopt that child. With the older kids, it's a, little, it's a little different because they're not 
cuddly like an infant is. So an eight-year-old or 10-year-old, it's a little different. So there's not that same demand for those types of children, and that's unfortunate. Yes. Well, congratulations on this new unit. I hope things go well, and good luck on that National Adoption Day. That sounds like a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. In 2006, Arizona voters passed a ban on smoking in public places, but questions are being raised as to that ban and other aspects of smoking and they apply to e-cigarettes, which are becoming increasingly popular. Attorney Pavneet Singh Yupal of Fisher Phillips is here to help clear all of this up. And I may have made it a little more confusing with my introduction here, but this is, thank you for being here. Uh, this is really interesting stuff. Let's start with a definition. What is an e-cigarette? Well, an e-cigarette is essentially a vaporized nicotine delivery device. The main difference is people are all familiar with tobacco products, cigars, cigarettes, which involve the burning of tobacco. There is no tobacco burned in an e-cigarette. It is essentially a device which involves a cartridge that delivers nicotine in a vaporized form. So there's no smoke, but there's vapor. How much vapor? Well, the vapor, the, the visual of the vapor tends to mimic the act of smoking. So you will not see uh, as much smoke as you would with a cigarette or a cigar, but you will see basically a puff which uh, looks like smoke, but it's not. It's actually an aerosolized vapor. So is that vapor harmful? I mean, does it smell? Uh, it tends not to smell, and the jury's out on the harm. One of the thoughts is that e-cigarettes are essentially marketed as being healthier, both for the user as well as people who may not be smokers but are not uh, subject to the effects of secondhand smoking. That's the way it's marketed that it's a healthier alternative both for the user and that it may also allow the user to quit as the user could, for example, swap out the cartridges to substitute cartridges that have ever smaller amounts of nicotine. Mm. However, whether or not this is, is such a new product and such a new concept that the science is not complete on whether this really is healthier for the mm -hmm. user or other people that may be exposed to it. And so we still have a lot to learn with this. With that in mind, the 2006, as we mentioned, the voter approved ban on smoking in public places. Obviously, that was done because of secondhand smoke and the health concerns to those around smokers. How do e-cigarettes play into all this? Absolutely. Arizona was ahead of the curve. Uh, it was ahead of most states in passing a smoking ban in most public places, including private places of employment in 2006. And you're right. The concept was that this isn't just an issue that affects the smoker himself or herself, but the smoke itself, because of the effects of secondhand smoking, it was affecting everyone else in the workplace. So as of 2006 in Arizona, smoking is essentially banned in enclosed places, including the workplace, as well as, for example, in company vehicles. However, that act is limited to the smoking of tobacco because that, the Smoke-Free Workplace Act, in its definitional section, talks about burning tobacco. So now when you go to e-cigarettes, there is no tobacco being burned. So 
the statute itself does not apply to e-cigarettes. It may be amended. The legislature may decide to do so. But as of right now, that act does not apply to, sm to e-cigarettes. And, and that's interesting. Now, let's say I want to smoke some tea leaves or I want to smoke something I found out in the desert or whatever the case may be. It's not tobacco. Does that mean it doesn't apply regarding this law? Uh, well, it may, it may apply to things such as clothes. But in your example, you are still burning an item. So burning an item is, is the key. That's right. That's and, right. and with e-cigarettes, e you don't burn anything. That's right. It's, it's vaporized and it's aerosolized. So you're not burning tobacco or tobacco-like uh, plant-based products. As far as you know now, bars and eateries, uh, employers, how are they handling e-cigarettes? Because that's kind of, that was where the, the big hit happened in 2006 and a lot of the concentration was. Uh, are, are they saying no to e-cigarettes? Are you seeing any of that out there so far? We are. Uh, the reality is that most employers have not implemented, as of yet, formalized policies with respect to e-cigarettes. Employers in Arizona, in general, do have formalized policies mimicking the Arizona Smoke-Free Act which, under which employers have said you cannot smoke in the workplace, you cannot smoke in company vehicles. But again, because that act does not apply to e-cigarettes, companies and employers are grappling with what they should do in response to this. Now, there's no law that says that you have to permit people to smoke e-cigarettes in the workplace. So in terms of a prediction, our prediction is that most employers in Arizona will eventually treat e-cigarettes in the same manner as they treat cigarettes themselves. And I'm seeing some distant irony here in the sense that you're telling someone you got to go out to the smoking area with your e-cigarette and get all that secondhand smoke while you're trying to get kick the habit or at least be healthier with your e-cigarette. Something's a little wrong about that, doesn't it? it? It is, and that's why we for example, my firm at Fisher & Phillips, we're advising our clients that if you are a company that does allow designated smoking areas for your employees that smoke tobacco products, you should set up a separate area, a segregated area for those who are using e-cigarettes. And it's not intended to cast aspersions on one group or the other, but the reality is what you said. Many people who are using e-cigarettes are actually trying to, are actually current tobacco users who are trying to quit. Whether it works or not remains to be seen, but their theory is, is that if they've tried the patch and it hasn't worked, if they've tried to go cold turkey and that hasn't worked, here's another product that if they continually swap out the cartridges with progressively smaller amounts of nicotine delivery, they might be able to wean themselves. So as a result, we think a best practice is that if you are going to allow people to smoke and you're going to have a designated smoking area, you should have a separate designated smoking area for e-cigarette users so they're not inhaling the sec secondhand smoke and defeating the purpose. And even if they're not trying to quit, you're basically banishing someone to go hang out out there where it's unhealthy. We've decided it's unhealthy. Go on, go there. I mean, that doesn't seem to make sense. Absolutely. Um, right. I don't know how far you get into this kind of thing, but. Um, Increasing numbers of insurance policies are, are looking at whether or not you are a cigarette smoker. Whether or not you are an e-cigarette smoker, is that now on the horizon? Is that, going, is that a question already being asked? To my knowledge, it's not already being asked, but I can definitely see uh, insurance questionnaires going that route. But what remains to be seen is how the insurance ratings will take place. You know, most people realize that if you're a cigarette smoker, you may have to pay a higher premium for a life insurance policy or the like. With e-cigarettes, again, the jury is out. Is, is it really going to turn out that people who um, take up the habit of smoking e-cigarettes will be able to then wean themselves off tobacco products? Or is it going to be a separate addiction in and of itself? Yeah, it's interesting. You're showing initiative, showing gumption there, trying to get off cigarettes, or are you just basically plopping down into another vice and we got to cover you? And it's, exactly. it's, there's still a lot of things to clear up in there. It's, it's a very new product. Uh, for example, you can see e-cigarette commercials on television. When's the last <laughs> time that you've seen a tobacco product <laughs> that's, on, that's on television? That's true. Didn't think of that. Uh, good information. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me.
expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org, click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features to help you make a more informed viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or scroll down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. There's also a page for educators. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. The Arizona Science Center is home to a traveling exhibit that examines the secrets of ancient Egypt. The star attraction, a mummy. Producer Shauna Fisher takes us on a tour. An entire civilization is on display, waiting to be discovered. Lost Egypt, Ancient Secrets, Modern Science is all about the life of ancient Egyptians, what the commoners' life was like, how they lived every day, their relationships, and it's also about the modern technology and science that goes behind studying that and finding out their stories. The interactive exhibit offers a comprehensive look at a country rich in history. There's a lot of hands-on exhibits in this Lost Egypt exhibition, including uh, we have mirrors that you can walk into an actual recreation of a tomb with, with tomb art, and you can use the mirror to reflect the light like early archaeologists would have done to see inside. There's also a dig pit, there's a replica of the Rosetta Stone, and you can even try to put together some pottery. But the highlight of the exhibit is a 2,000-year-old mummy named Annie, short for anonymous. A mummy is a preserved body, and that can happen naturally through environmental processes, and it can also be intentional. So in the case of the ancient Egyptians, they intentionally mummified these bodies because the afterlife was so important to them that they wanted to preserve the body for the soul to move on to the afterlife. Not much is known about Annie, but using modern science techniques, archaeologists were able to piece together some clues. They know Annie drowned in the Nile, a sacred river, which is why priests took great care in mummifying her. And it was their job to preserve the body. And they would begin by washing it with water from the Nile. So that, that was their sacred river, and they would purify it with the water from the Nile. And then the next step would be to remove the organs, because you want it to stop the body from decomposing. The heart was left in, because that was, to the Egyptians, the center of knowledge and emotion. So it was very important to them, and they needed that in the afterlife. And then it was washed again and oils put on it so it smelled nice. And then they would wrap it up in the linens, sometimes 15 to 20 layers of linens. And inside those linens they would stuff amulets, which were religious symbols that would protect them in their journey to the afterlife. So it was a very, it lasted about 70 days, this process. Equal care was given to Annie's sarcophagus, or the coffin-like structure she was buried in. And what that is, is that the ancient Egyptians were very religious and everything on her that's been painted, the colors, the symbols, all have a significant meaning about taking her safely into the afterlife. The exhibit also showcases artifacts, including vessels and amulets. And there are lots of activities for children, all geared towards unlocking mysteries of this ancient land. I think people can take away from lost Egypt the fact that even though these people existed thousands of years ago, they're a lot like us and they had political troubles and emotional troubles and that things don't really change just with technology. You're still humans and there's a lot that we can learn from the past that may be able to help us in the future. Lost Egypt, Ancient Secrets, Modern Science runs until September 1st at the Arizona Science Center. For more information, you can visit their website, azscience.org. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, hear about an in-depth study of air pollution in the valley. And we'll look at efforts to help veterans reintegrate into society. Those stories and more, 5, 30, and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.